Cool. Whoa. Okay. That's my voice. So um, the talk today is called, on the schedule, An Over-Engineering Disaster with Macaroons. But I have to tell you, that's actually kind of the clickbait version of the title. Um, I really want to go into both the pros and the cons of macaroons today. So a more realistic title might be Macaroons, Maybe Not. So what is a macaroon? Well, macaroons are a relatively new kind of authorization credential. And some folks at Google wrote a paper describing or announcing them, and that was published in 2014. And then last fall, my team started using them. But after a few months, we wanted to get rid of them. So this is just that story. OK, so to begin, let's talk about a common problem when building services, which is auth. And when I say auth, I really mean the twin problems of authentication, who you are, and authorization, or what you can do. And between these two questions, you should be able to determine if a given action is allowed. Now, this is probably sort of a mundane framing, and it was for me too, because on just about every project I've worked on, we've had endpoints, and we've wanted to protect them with some kind of auth. And we'd always solve this problem in more or less the same way. So this is what we were doing at Chain in April 2017. When a request came in, we'd pluck a username and a password from the basic auth fields of the request, and then we'd check that they were valid together. And if the request passed to this step, we'd stick the user in the context. Then we'd move on to an authorization check where we'd make sure that the user was actually allowed to make this request. So we set each route up with a policy like read-write and then granted individual users permission to operate within each policy. When a request came in, we'd check the policy on the route and then figure out if we'd actually granted this user permission by checking that token we'd stuck in the context. So in other words, we'd set up this set of access control lists or ACLs inside our service. So I thought this was just the way auth was done. If you wanted to authenticate someone, a user, a service, against your service, you just do something like this. But it turns out there's a whole long history of folks wrestling with this problem, and it shook out to two separate approaches. So one relied on capabilities, that is, directly granting someone the capability to do something specific, and the other relied on identity, that is, asking who that someone is, and then determining if they can take action. And that's a little abstract, so let me give you an example, which I borrowed from one of the authors of the Macaroons paper. So let's use this car as an example. It's a nice car, it's maybe a little two-dimensional, but you know, it's pretty good. Okay, so how can we determine if this car can be started? Well, we could create a key for it, and then anyone who has the key, regardless of who that is, can drive it. And this is a capability-based system. On the other hand, let's imagine that this red car is an identity-based car. And this car will ask any potential drivers to verify who they are. Then it can look them up, maybe through a central driver identity service, before deciding to start. OK, so now let's extend this metaphor. So now our friend here is going to a fancy restaurant, which is why he's suddenly wearing a suit. And he wants a valet to park the car. So if this is the capability-based car, he hands the key to the valet, and the valet, valet can take the car and park it. Um, unfortunately, the valet could also drive off with the car or lose the key to a robber, so it's kind of dangerous to have a token that has so much power. On the other hand, if this is an identity-based car, our emoji friend will need to program the valet's information into the car, maybe using his driver's license, and then the valet can drive the car. And that's not great either, because now we need this trusted driver's license service. Um, but there's a bigger problem here, too. And that's that relying on identity can be dangerous in any system where there are more than two principles, like multiple services. This is outlined very thoroughly in a paper called Ackles Don't, which concludes that the Ackle model is unable to make correct access decisions for interactions involving more than two principles, since required information is not retained across message sends. So in other words, if there's a restricted action and then a deputy with the authority to take that action, the deputy can get confused and act on behalf of another actor who doesn't actually have that authority. And this is called the confused deputy problem. So that's also a little abstract, so I want to give you a concrete example, which is cross-site request forgery or CSERF. So in a CSERF attack, the browser gets tricked into sending its cookies and its credentials to a malicious URL. 
So in this example, if Alice can get Bob to load this Exchange URL while he's logged into the Exchange somewhere else in his browser session, the browser will go ahead and send his credentials along and authorize this malicious transaction. Now, as a service, the safest way to stop this is to generate a special token, which is unique per session, and then require that on each request. So now Alice can't create a valid request because she doesn't know the per session credential. And that's interesting because that per session credential is a capability. So we gain some safety by sprinkling a capability into an identity-based system. But what if there was a middle ground? What if something could safely combine the strengths of both the capability and the identity models? What if a bearer token like our car key could be attenuated or limited in a way that makes it much safer? So this would be like if our emoji friend could hand the valet a key that wouldn't work generally, but would work within a one mile radius, or if the driver was wearing the valet company uniform, or some other set of caveats that are based on the context. And this is how macaroons behave. They're bearer tokens, but they're contextually attenuated, so their power is limited. And they're designed in this really pragmatic way, because as far as users are concerned, they should behave just like cookies. So how do they do that? What are the mechanics of a macaroon? In order to dig into that, I first want to step back and talk briefly about basic auth, and then build on that to show you how we make macaroons. So when you make a request using basic auth, you just stick a username and password in the request header's authorization field, and that's what that looks like in Go standard library. You can just call set basic auth on any HTTP request, and it just kind of works. And that's great. But there are a couple problems, and in particular, I want to call out two issues. So first, the username and password have to be provided on every request and stored somewhere indefinitely, typically in a cookie. And that's scary, because an attacker could do anything they want if they get a hold of them, right? The second issue is that basic auth only addresses the issue of authentication. So to limit what users can do, you actually still need some kind of identity-based access control list logic. OK, so let's address these concerns one at a time. First, the danger of always passing a username and token around. So instead of passing them around, they can be exchanged for a token. And naively, this token can just be a random string. And when the token is used in a request, the server keeps a map of tokens to users and checks it on every request. And this is more or less what I showed you earlier, what we were doing at Chain. But there's a more sophisticated way of doing token auth, too. And that one relies on hashes and HMACs. So HMACs are a way to authenticate your message using a hash. And an HMAC takes a key and a message as input and outputs their hash. And this is pretty much how you do that, again, using uh, the Go standard library. And you might say, OK, well, what's, what's going on under the hood there? Well, the HMAC construction can be described in this easy to understand format. Or you can just look at the code in the standard library, which is OK, only a little bit more legible at first glance. But here's what you should notice. So the new function takes another hash's new function. So you can, you can use any hash function um, oops, and a key, two inputs. And the return value is a hash. So an HMAC behaves like any other hash, hash function, except that the output of this particular instantiation will depend on this key. But really, the most important takeaway here is that HMACs can really help with auth. So for example, you might store a single secret key on your server, which you would then use as an input key to an HMAC. And the username, along with the timestamp, would be the input message. And then the resulting hash is a token that you can use instead of a username and password. So now you no longer keep track of individual tokens for each user. You can just keep track of a single key. And like all hashes, an HMAC is a one-way function. So no one can get the key out of the resulting hash or generate their own token without the correct key which stays safely on the server. And now the username, along with the token, can be stored in a cookie. And we can call this our cookie. And that can be submitted on every request. So tokens and HMACs make basic auth safer and easier. But again, they only improve authentication, not authorization. And in order to limit the scope of a token, a server using token auth still has to check this user's permissions. This is where macaroons come in handy. Macaroons have a way of baking the authorization rules right into the token. And they do that by adding layers to cookies. So if we start with that same cookie from before, which is this HMAC construction, we can say that evaluates to 1. Um, if we want to limit this credential so that it's read only, we can create a new caveat, like this string, 
and then create a new HMAC with this caveat. So in this new HMAC, the caveat is the request, and the token from the original cookie is the hash key. And the result of this new HMAC, which we might call two, is the credential that we can use in requests. OK, so what does that look like in code without an emoji? Well, hold on. I'm, I'm, the Denver air is getting to me. They told me to drink water so I don't smack. So I'm smacking. OK. Um, so anyway, um, that's given you a moment to look at this code. Um, and you can see in this example, each team gets its own macaroon. And the important things to notice here are that we first create an unattenuated macaroon, that is a macaroon with no caveats, and then we add a caveat that limits this macaroon's power to a specific team. And you might also notice that we encode the caveat as protocol buffer, and that's because there's no standard format for them. Um, and this is all code from the chain code base, and we use the Go macaroons package, which makes it all possible. So what's going on in that package? Like, what's going on behind the scenes? So this is what a macaroon looks like under the hood. Uh, the location is a hint that tells users where this macaroon is accepted. And we actually left it blank at chain since we over, only ever had one target service. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, the ID is a unique identifier. And the caveats are slices of these like caveat objects um, that the macaroon has. And then the signature is an important piece, because that's the final HMAC result in that long HMAC chain that I started describing earlier. So the signature gets updated every time we add a caveat, which happens like this. You can see the signature getting updated here. Um, and notice that the previous signature is getting passed into this keyed hash function. And then inside the keyed hash function, you can see that the key, which again is really the previous signature, is being used to set up a new HMAC. OK, so how is a macaroon used in a request? Um, well, now the entity making the request can pass this whole thing along, and the server can prove that the macaroon is valid by recalculating all of the intermediary hashes, starting with its own secret key. And there's like a bunch of things going on in this snippet, um, which is also from the chain code base. Uh, first, you should ignore this grayed out section, since I'll get into what all that's doing in a minute. Um, but really, you can see here that we're just getting the macaroon out of the request context, setting up a caveat verifier, and then calling verify on the macaroon with the verifier and the secret key. The trickiest part of this was setting up that caveat verifier, which I made really small here and also truncated because it's really long. Um, but basically, this just returns a function that knows each of the possible caveats for a macaroon and how to validate each caveat. So just to be clear, this is not the same thing as the verifier knowing all possible macaroons, it just knows all the ways that a given macaroon might be limited. So the server will never need to do any kind of identity lookup or check an ACL because the permissions of the token are specified right inside the token itself. So you might have noticed the phrase first party caveat sprinkled around the code. And that's because the caveats I've described so far have all been added by the target service, which means that they're first party caveats. But one of the coolest things about macaroons is that anyone can add caveats to a macaroon they hold, not just the target services. And any caveat that's added by someone else is called a third-party caveat. And they're useful any time you want a third-party service to also sign off on some action. So the classic example here is an identity service. Um, for example, if, if I want to share my vacation pictures with my family, but I don't want to manage user accounts for everyone, I might use Google as my identity service. So as long as my sister is logged into her Google account, she can access the pictures. And they're added largely the same way that first party caveats are. Um, they also get added through HMAC chaining. But there are a couple of twists here. So the first twist happens when the caveat is being added. The third party needs to know the caveat's ID and verification ID so that it knows how to satisfy or discharge it. And the other twist happens when it's being verified. So in order to verify a macaroon with a third party caveat, the third party caveat has to be discharged by another macaroon, which is called the discharge macaroon, and comes from the third party itself. So in this example, my sister can fetch the discharge macaroon from Google and then pass it along with her original macaroon to the target service, although the target service could also retrieve the discharge macaroon itself. So this starts to look a bit like something like OAuth, but with fewer round trip requests. So we got pretty excited about this at Chain, partly because it's just interesting, um, and partly because we saw how macaroons could solve a problem that we had, have had. Um, and to explain that, I have to tell you a little about what we do at Chain. 
So Chain has a product called Sequence, which is a hosted blockchain as a service. And if you want to know more about what that means, come talk to me later, because this is really, really not a blockchain talk. Um, but the important thing to know here is that Sequence hosts many independent private blockchains in a multi-tenant setup. The relevant part of Sequence's architecture looks a little like this. So we have a couple services. This first service is called Ledger D, um, and it's written in Go, and it owns all of the blockchain logic and provides the API for like, the core product. And then we also have Dashboard, which is a Rails app that provides a nice web interface for users and also does all the user management. Um, so Dashboard is the app that knows about users, teams, emails, things like that. And when a customer uses Sequence, they often use the dashboard, but they can also use an SDK in their client application that talks to Ledger D directly. So maybe you can see the auth problem that comes up here, right? Like, who owns auth? Because dashboard is the only service that knows about users, but Ledger D has API endpoints on it that need to be protected. And this kind of situation, where dashboard needs to make auth decisions for actions executed inside Ledger D, this is like the recipe for a confused deputy. And macarons are perfect for unconfusing the deputy. So we dove right into swapping out our old auth system. So we decided to have Ledger D, which is our target service, mint each team an all-powerful golden macaroon without any caveats. Ledger D would then hand the golden macaroon to Dashboard, which could then attenuate the golden macaroon with third-party caveats to restrict it to a certain user at which point it's no longer a golden macaroon. This attenuated macaroon was then shared with the end user who could stick it in their SDK. Um, and so when a client application would make an API request, it would pre present this attenuated macaroon. And of course, because the macaroon had a third-party caveat, the client application would also need to present a discharge macaroon alongside the main macaroon. Unfortunately, users didn't need to know about this, because uh, our SDKs would handle this behind the scenes, so they just quietly fetch a new discharge macaroon before the old one expired. So this was not a terribly complicated flow, and we were pretty pleased that we managed to isolate all the logic about users inside Dashboard, and that Dashboard could communicate that to Ledger D inside the auth token itself. But this talk had the word disaster in the title, or at least one of the titles. And we haven't seen any disasters yet, so here we go. OK, macaroons, the bad parts. <laughs> so the first problem was that we had just created an availability dependence on Dashboard. If Dashboard went down and therefore couldn't produce a discharge macaroon, then users wouldn't be able to access the API. And this was especially scary since we expected, expected our Go API um, to be more stable than Dashboard, which is a Rails app. Another problem was that it was very cumbersome to use the API, especially without an SDK. So we had to manually fetch a discharge macaroon every five minutes and then provide that alongside the main macaroon for every single request. And previously, it had been trivial for any engineer to run a simple version of the system locally. But macaroons made it so cumbersome that most people just stopped with noticeably negative effects on, on our code. A third problem was that we let users have roles, like admin. And when someone changed their user role in Dashboard, their token would stay the same. So unless they rotated out their token as well, their permissions wouldn't actually change. And this was really confusing to users, and occasionally also to our engineering team. Um, and this also could have been a problem with the way that we modeled this. Like, maybe the concept of a role is just incompatible with any kind of um, capability type auth model. I'm not sure. On a similar note, revoking a credential took up to five minutes. So if we wanted to revoke a macaroon, we need to tell Dashboard to stop issuing discharge macaroons. But any given discharge macaroon was valid for five minutes, and we couldn't like claw it back once it had been issued. So we ultimately solved this problem. We did not solve this problem. We solved this problem by making each request check in with Dashboard. Um, so each request would have to go to Dashboard as well to make sure that the discharge macaroon hadn't been revoked. But like, this defeated the whole point of using macaroons. And I know that revocation is really hard, but macaroons did not make it any easier. Then there were also a few minor but prickly usability issues. So our macaroons were often too long to fit on a single line in any environment, which made it really hard to just like inspect them visually. And then there were also Base64 encoded, 
which meant that they included some characters that macOS treated as a word boundary. So if you double clicked on the macaroon, you wouldn't get the whole macaroon. And then because it was so long, you had no idea you didn't have the whole macaroon. And this sounds really stupid, but it caused a lot of problems. And then finally, the biggest problem was that the word macaroon turned out to be contentious. Because a macaroon in this context is a cookie with layers, right? But in a bakery, the cookie with layers is actually called a macaron. <laughs> now, you might be thinking to yourself, wow, I was really sold on macaroons, and now I feel like I've had the rug pulled out from underneath me. Well, believe me, I know how that feels, and my whole engineering team knows how that feels, because we added macaroons to our system in October, and by January, we were starting to have serious doubts. By the end of February, we decided we were going to remove macaroons and go back to a more basic auth system. Not basic auth exactly, but what I like to call pumpkin spice auth. So pumpkin spice auth unfortunately duplicates auth logic across Ledgerd and Dashboard, but it doesn't have any of the issues that macaroons had. But it turned out that removing macaroons was way, way harder than adding them. So it took uh, two weeks to add macaroons, but removing them took five months. So, no, really. So we didn't want to break all of our users who had macaroons, who were, were using them, so we thought we'd convert the old macaroons into new pumpkin spice credentials. But that was impossible because no one but the user actually holds that macaroon. So we couldn't just like do a database migration or something. So the best thing we could do was just wait uh, for the macaroon to come in with a request and then store its hash as a new pumpkin spice credential. So this meant that we had to wait several months just to make sure that all of the outstanding macaroons were converted before removing the code that handles them. Okay, so let me just be really clear. I still think macaroons are super cool. They're probably the best auth abstraction that I've ever seen, and learning about them and using them gave me a new appreciation for all of the nuances around auth. But they were definitely not the right tool for us. With our sparse pair of services, we don't have that many opportunities for a confused deputy, so we were solving problems that we hadn't actually seen yet. This became a classic exercise in over-engineering. Macaroons are an elegant technology, but they're also a novel technology. They're not commonly used, and things like the caveat format are still unspecified. There aren't many providers for third-party caveats, let alone robust providers for third-party caveats. There is a decent amount of literature describing them, but there's not that much out there from folks who've used them in production. My team likes boring technology, which is partly why we do so much with Go. Really. Um, thanks. Um, and in the end, we found that macaroons were just too exciting. Um, so if you think macaroons also sound exciting, but maybe not too exciting for you, uh, you might be interested in some of these links. I'll make sure the slides get posted and all these links get posted. Um, a lot of these links just expand. I either mention them or they expand on ideas that I mentioned today. And that's all I have. Thank you so much.